First up, Stonehaig has been operating under the radar as a family office for well over 30 years in South Africa. The firm was recently named the country's top wealth manager based on its ability to independently advise and implement investment strategies for high net worth clients. Johan van Sale joins us in studio to discuss their investment strategy. Well, let's look at the ins and outs of dealing with private family wealth. There must be an entire philosophy that uh, is surrounded with exactly that target target audience. Absolutely right, Bronwyn. Uh, it's, it's a global business. Uh, it's complicated. Large clients tend to have complex structures. And that's where we add uh, most of our value. Our solutions for our clients are entirely unique and tailored to each individual. Just in terms of that, Johan, I mean, we've got this uh, concept of a family office that many South Africans aren't too familiar with. Just in your words, what does it actually mean to provide a family office solution? Very simply put, it's, it's providing an integrated service based on a client's financial needs, ranging from estate planning to preparation of accounts to investment management. How do you enter into, or how do you mine wealthy families? I, I have noticed, and, and maybe I'm remiss, that although you, from an accolade perspective, you have just been uh, awarded on that front, but the, the Stonehenge brand is not a prevalent one, or am I wrong? No, it's, uh, I think it's discreet, Ron. It's I mean, very that's, discreet. That's, that's sort of its purpose. It doesn't quite want to be out there because it's, it's obviously servicing the needs of that very high net worth. So it's a stealth, a stealth approach. A stealth approach, would that be the right term uh, to, to sort of marketing yourself, Johan? Yeah? I'm not too sure, you know, how you, how you get in touch with these. It's, it's really by word of mouth. That's right, Warren. It is generally word of mouth. Uh, we've been doing this since 1976 on a global basis. And our client families talk to each other. And, and generally, these things come up in a, a dinner party conversation. And, and we then uh, get referred to by, by those clients. All right, so what do you do? for a wealthy family? Let's cut to the crux of it. So we will look at their entire picture. Uh, we only add value to our clients if we can understand the whole. We don't have to necessarily be involved in managing every single component, but we, we need to understand the big picture and we need to, to provide a coordinated approach to a client's affairs. So we're effectively the glue that brings it all together for the client. An end-to-end -end solution. Absolutely. So I get, from that perspective, I mean, some of the, the things that we saw in your submission is you go, f you do, you, so you can manage everything from putting a family constitution together, uh, adding an investment strategy, and then all the way through to making sure that the yacht and the plane are licensed in the right jurisdiction and the tax affairs are, be are taken care of. So the concept of a family office extends well, well beyond that idea of just wealth management. It does, and, and the, the, the biggest value add that we bring to our clients is the experience we gain from other clients. So in fact, we learn far more from our other clients than they probably learn from us. And, and we can apply what's, what we've learned with one particular family to that of another. How are you feeling about the, the current equity market? And uh, specifically globally, we're in a tough economic environment. Are the people that you deal with relatively more defensive in nature in that they don't feel the, the ebb and flow of bad economic environments? They do. Our clients, by, by their very nature, are much longer term in outlook. Um, so we do take a very conservative approach. Uh, we often call it, uh, we manage stay rich portfolios rather than get rich portfolios. So it's really about the preservation of capital. And we do try and do that over a much longer term than you would find in an institutional asset manager, for example. Is, the, is that because, I mean, the, the, the wealth is very much uh, looked, uh, looked upon as something that they want to transfer sort of across generations within families? Is, is that what leads them to this sort of long-term perspective that's, I guess, very beneficial when, you, when you're considering an, an investment strategy? Yes, you, you, you're trying to preserve real wealth for our families uh, over time. So you've got to stay ahead of inflation. Um, and, and it's to look after the next generation. Most of our clients, or the, uh, in fact the wealth creator, won't be able to spend the wealth that they have created in their lifetime. But what's important for them is to look after that next generation and the generation beyond. Would you say then that there's a dearth of aggressive strategies um, in, in your portfolios? That as you say, it's about preservation of capital. Is there any element there that contains excessive risk? <laughs> Uh, it depends on the client, uh, and, and a portfolio will have aggressive elements to it and then more conservative elements, but the combined portfolio 
will, will tend to be much lower risk by nature. But the way we really look at it, Bronwyn, is the, the fact that our clients are the ones out there. They're the entrepreneurs. They are in the high risk business. We're in the capital preservation business. In terms of the capital preservation, uh, there's, there's been, you, you mentioned there's been quite a lot of push from clients to try and reduce the costs of investing. Do you think that's just been a function of where we are in the world at the moment and investment returns being very depressed over the last mm -hmm. five years as opposed to just a trend? And, and how have you sort of adapted the business to suit those uh, demands? Well, we, we've, we've uh, taken a very uh, proactive approach in that, in trying to reduce fees across our clients' portfolios where we can. And, and I think it is a function of the environment we're operating in today. We're in a, in a low return environment, and therefore fees are far more noticeable uh, from the days when you're earning 10 to 15% um, in a portfolio. So it is very important to our clients, and it's not something that they've, that they've suddenly just cottoned onto. Um, you'll find people that, that have built up uh, a lot of wealth uh, watch their pennies very carefully as well. 11 countries is your um, geographic uh, spread. Do you leverage off your, your global offices in terms of that wealth preservation? Absolutely. Uh, Stone Egg has a classic South African footprint. South Africans are, are global these days. They're all over the world and we've followed our clients uh, around the globe. So we might have children in America and we can use our, our, our US office, um, whereas the patriarch is still living uh, in South Africa and there might be another sibling that's gone to university in the UK. So we, we, we plug the whole uh, office network into servicing that client. You've only been advisory as well. I think at one time you did have an in-house investment, uh, investment funds which you ran, but you've, uh, you've sold those. Uh, what do you think, you know, is, is this a big uh, topic of discussion for uh, the very high net worth um, family that you can have an advisor and a product provider in the same firm? Or is it something that they, you seem to, to find that they, they like about your firm is that you're advisory only? Because this is something we had to try and assess when we were doing this exercise mm -hmm. around which, which wealth management firms uh, with the, the really high net worth families like. And uh, that independence is quite important and obviously being discreet. But uh, was that a conscious decision you made after uh, getting feedback from your clients that it, it, you simply can't be a product provider and an advisor at the same time? That's absolutely right, Warren. We, we learned a valuable lesson from that where we were an asset manager or we had a, an asset management company. And the issue was around conflicts of interest between that of acting as a trustee and then the, the ultimate uh, portfolio or asset manager. And, and having, having eliminated that, that model and, and gone more to an advisory approach, we can now sit on the same side of the table as our client and provide truly independent advice. Tell us a little bit about the survey that you conducted at here. So, so we did the, the private bank wealth manager survey for Investors Monthly, uh, the magazine I write for, and, and that was obviously to talk about uh, which which, uh, which of the South Africa's top private banks and wealth managers um, would meet the, the demands of five different types of archetypes. So we created these five uh, clients, I guess, the, the, the five standard clients we'd expect to see uh, in the marketplace for private banking and wealth management services. And then obviously we included the, the client survey to, to get feedback from the client. So we went through quite an in-depth uh, um, exercise with each of the wealth managers asking them questions around how they meet the needs, uh, what their solutions are. And uh, one of the key things uh, we found that obviously was that clients like independent advice, but there are many wealth managers out there that also that are asset managers and product providers mm. as well. Mm. So, so what, what were the rankings? Um, so we ranked uh, Stone Age as the best uh, wealth manager in the country because of its ability to service high net worth families um, and high net worth clients uh, across borders and provide bespoke and independent advice. And that's something we, we certainly got from the submission that, uh, that you made. And it goes, you know, the, the concept of the family office goes as broad as uh, what I mentioned from looking after the licenses for, for, lots, uh, for yachts and, and airplanes all the way through to providing an investment strategy. So, Who, Who's <laughs> on their heels, Warren? Close, uh, close was Maitland. Uh, but I think, if I'm not mistaken, Investec Wealth and Investments uh, was also very close. Also got a, a global portfolio. I wanted to see, uh, ask you, Han, who he saw as his biggest competition in the market. It's a, it's a good question, Warren, and obviously something we debate a lot internally. And I think there are lots of uh, really good uh, providers out there. Um, but in the truly independent space, um, 
there, there are a few that we actually come, uh, come across uh, consistently. So uh, different names will pop up at different times depending on what the client needs. But So some are better in certain areas than others, but we, we, we don't see one. You can't skirt this one. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to have to tell me at least two names of two companies that, come, that you come across quite often when you're pitching for the same business. Well, I think on the survey in, in the two categories that we, we were top ranked in, uh, Investec Wealth came up in, in both of those. And I would say... We, we do see them uh, more often than, than the others. Yeah. We just wanted to get into uh, investment strategy. We always, obviously, with, with uh, very high net worth families, uh, there's always the idea that they have access to investment vehicles that the man in the street doesn't. Is that true? And uh, you know, what, what have you been finding? What's the, the, the X factor for some of these clients in terms of their investment strategy? I think, uh, Warren, those, those vehicles are available to most investors. The issue is actually around cost and it's, it's asset size. If you have a, a, a lower threshold of assets that you can put into these efficient vehicles, the costs actually don't justify it. So you need a certain uh, amount of scale in order to, to fully utilize the benefits of some of these vehicles.